as we get off to this new school year, we thought it was a good time just to uh, sort of set set off on the right foot and get a sense of where we're at. And um, a lot of the teachers that we are are talking with now um, are really expressing concerns about learning loss and where their kids at, are at at this point and how do we address that? How can we help our students in this in this time? So um, uh, we, uh, with that thought in mind, um, mm -hmm. Today's objectives are we're going to look at a baseline assessment because I think in order for us to be able to really address what the needs of our students are is we really need to to take a look at that baseline. Where are they starting and what do we need to do to help them move along? And then um, we're going to talk about how to, what do we do? Let's talk about returning to basics, um, direct skill instruction. We even went so far as to um, really include as part of this uh, webinar today, um, four weeks of a sentence a day. And the reason why we did that is because we've heard from a lot of teachers that their students are really feeling um, that they were feeling that their students were even struggling with sentence development, having lost um, so much time in the classroom. And then we're going to really revisit the whole idea of what are those foundational lessons that we we do so often and how can we use them to really meet the needs of our students and where they're at. And so as we start, a couple of things that I'm going to ask you to do, if you can, and you're in a position where you can keep your camera on, we love to see faces. Um, we're hungry for them. We miss our in-person visits. So if you can keep your camera on and let us see you, we really appreciate that. If you have any questions as we're talking, feel free to chat them in the chat box. Um, my name is Daya Ore, and I'm co-presenting today with Jennifer Seaton. And so both Jennifer and I are here to answer your questions as we move along. And um, so feel free to put those in there so that if you have something that's really um, on top of your mind and you wanna you want us to address it, please, please do that. Um, so let's drive right into uh, the whole idea of the learning loss because the reality is, is learning loss is something we deal with all the time. And I know we're seeing it on a whole nother level uh, with COVID and having our kids back in the classrooms and, and, um, and recognizing how much our students have lost in this last year and a half. Um, but you know, we want to just to look at it, define it, and then we can really address it. The loss of knowledge and skills that students experience when they're not in school. Um, and it's the idea that learning decays over time if students don't engage with it regularly. So what we're gonna be talking with you today about is really how do we how do we look at that? Um, how do we support our students? And you know, the reasons why learning loss occurs um, could be a lot. It could be summer break. It could be um, some interrupted um, formal education. It could be dropouts. It could be school absence. It could be ineffective teaching. Um, and as we all know, many of us have experienced COVID. So there's a lot of reasons why our students could be experiencing summer lo um, some learning loss. Um, and some of it we deal with every year. And we know what that's like when they come back after summer break. So the question really is, is what do we do and how do we assess where our students are at? So let's let's go and, and start with the, the where we want you to begin. For those of you who have our resources, if you have our, um, our resources and have the hub, you'll have access to uh, the baseline prompts. So this is just an example um, of the baseline prompts that we have for narrative for grade four that are in there. And we also have checkpoint prompts. Our recommendation is either use our prompts. Um, if you have your own that you use, start out your school year with some baseline prompts so that we can assess um, where our students are at initially. So that's going to be important for in order for us to see what we have to um, what we have to address. And I'm going to remind you, and if, if you don't mind, I'm just going to stop for a moment, and ask this question. Would you chat in the chat box if you currently use Empowering Writers so that I um, so if you currently use Empowering Writers, just say yes. If you're not using Empowering Writers, just say no. And then I, it helps me understand a little bit about. Um, thank you, everybody. Good. So for those of you who are not using Empowering Writers, um, we're going to, Jen and I will be a little sensitive to the language that we use in terms of how we're talking today. And Katie, I, I love that positiveness. Not yet. Not yet. Um, so for those of you who have used Empowering Writers, and for those of you who are new to us, we always provide the baseline prompts. One of our... Um, one of the ways in which we talk with our students all the time is about the importance of, as we as teachers use a common language, 
and have assured experiences. And that's important so that when we look at student work, we know specifically what we're looking for. So we give them baseline prompt and we use that to assess where they're at. Now, I wanna share with you um, some prompts that we have, we have given in the past. And I want, I want you to look at this. And this is really important because I think all of us right now at the beginning of the year are feeling overwhelmed with where our students are. This is actually a, um, a baseline prompt that was given, it's a narrative piece. It's given at the beginning of second grade. And it says, imagine you went to your, that you went to your grandmother's farm. She asked you to milk the cow. You go to milk the cow, you hear a strange noise. You go to investigate and uh, tell what you discovered and what happens next. Okay, pretty basic prompt. Not that many kids are at their grandmother's farm milking cows, but still. One day I went to my grandmother's farm. She asked me to milk the cow, so I went into the barn to milk the cow. When I heard a noise, I went to the corner to see what it was. It was a puppy. It was a very cute puppy. My grandmother let me keep him. I named him Rover, the end. Now, from a perspective of first, beginning of second grade, what does this student demonstrate really well? First of all, it's organized. The student demonstrates they can read the prompt and they basically just regurgitated the prompt, added a little bit of detail, which is, uh, yes, restating the question, added a little bit of detail, which was I named him Rover. But at the beginning of second grade, if I have a student that walks into my classroom and can write this, I'm very happy, right? Because it's a great, um, it's a great uh, starting point. Now I wanna show you another prompt. Same exact prompt, same exact second grade class. This is what the student wrote. I fly to my grandma and milk the cow and boom, I was scared. I found what it was making the noise. P-U-P-U, -P -U, the cow farted. So now while that's entertaining, I, I picked this prompt particularly to show you both of those students same classroom, same September baseline, and two extremely different places. And I will be honest with you, when I first started teaching, if I had seen a student write like this, I would have no idea what to do next. I wouldn't even know where to start. I wouldn't know what kind of feedback to give. I wouldn't know what to say. I wouldn't know how to move the student along. I show you both of these because I'm gonna show you at towards the end, Jen and I are gonna share some growth over time. But it's important that we keep perspective on where our students are at. So what is it that we need to do with our students? So these same exact students to entirely different places at the beginning of the year, what do I need to do? So the first thing that I need to do is I need to rely on my methodology. The Empowering Writers methodology is always this, whole class instruction. When we're teaching writing, we take writing and we break it down by discrete skills. So for those of you who are not familiar with Empowering Writers, we have skills that we teach directly to students that support narrative writing. The way in which we do it is introduce and define the skill through the use of literature. We find great examples in writing. The more examples that I find in the writing, in the reading that I'm doing in the classroom, the better. So if I'm reading a read aloud, or I see I have a middle grade novel that I'm reading to my students, if I can find that skill and use it, that's what I do. I define that skill. Then we model the skill. Our job as teachers is modeling that skill, how do the authors write it. I'm talking out loud as the author and I'm developing that for my students. I'm asking productive questions. I'm asking my kids to contribute. I'm looking for students that don't have the language so I can give them the language, so I can help them develop the, the words that they need. After we model that skill, and again, if I'm teaching beginnings, I'm modeling one sentence. If I'm not gonna go deeper than that, it's just gonna be one or two sentences for beginning and then they're done. That's what I'm modeling. If I'm teaching elaborative detail, it's probably gonna be just a couple of sentences. I'm gonna develop that, I'm gonna model that and they're gonna try it. They're gonna try it happens in guided practice. And through guided practice, my kids are all going to do that. I'm gonna be walking around asking productive questions and I'm gonna be um, prompting my kids with those questions. Those productive questions are critical. And then from there, over time, we're gonna see application. So this is always gonna be our methodology for all of our instruction. And what this allows us to do is to build assured experiences and develop common vocabulary. 
so that my students and I can speak together. I can have an expectation for what I want them to put into their writing because we've taught it. And I'm going to, oh, you're going to hear us always say this for all of you who attend our webinars, oral always precedes written with our, we're, our job is to build language to help kids express themselves. And we're going to work on that. Um, so what we're going to do is for those of you who aren't familiar, let me just show you what our diamond looks like. And, and this is the writing diamond that we use for narrative writing. And essentially this is what students look at. It's a visual reminder of the, um, of, of the proportions the story takes and the elements that are exist in narrative writing. What I want you to realize is each one of these sections of the diamond are skills that we teach in isolation, discreetly, independently, through that methodology. So we practice all these skills and then eventually, while we're practicing these skills, we start putting it together into story. And when we talk about looking at student writing like the two pieces that we looked at, I believe we had Katie and Ben's pieces. When we look at Katie and Ben's pieces and we're saying, wow, these kids are really all over the place. I don't know what to do. We go back to the beginning, we go back to basics and we start teaching the foundational lessons that are necessary for students to have. And what we are gonna see as we walk you through this, what does that look like for students? And how does that affect their ability to write? Um, in, in first small little pieces and then eventually pulling it together. So Jen, I'm gonna just flip it over to you to really start to take us through the levels of the methodology. So when we talk about methodology, we always start with defining that skill through literature. Yes, and that's, that's what's great about all this is we talk to um, different school districts and we see our students coming in a couple of grade levels behind possibly because of what's been happening the last two years. Um, there is comfort in knowing that going back to the methodology, as we have always said, is exactly where we need to be. Don't change your practice necessarily. Make sure that we're doing it with consistency, that we're doing it daily, because the kids need this explicit instruction, but they need it so that they understand it, can follow it, come back to it. And one of the places that they can come back to always is literature. You know, if we're saying they're really low in writing, what are they also low in? They're low in reading. And when are they reading? across the day. They're reading in every subject area. They're reading in school. They're reading outside of school. So any opportunity that they have to come back to this skill of elaborative detail needs to be at the forefront of their mind for understanding. And not only from a generative aspect, but this reading writing connection will also allow our students to respond to what they're reading, which I know is at the forefront of many of your minds. So here we're going to define the skill of elaborative detail through the use of a book called Snow Day for Mouse. Okay, so I know we're widespread across grade levels possibly. We did have our focus pieces on the second grade level, um, but we know that this does apply to all grade levels. So hopefully you'll follow along and see the understanding as it can progress and because our students are um, in a, a, a lesser place at this time. So I just want to read this segment um, as it begins it says thump mouse landed in a snow drift when he climbed out what a sight met his eye heaps of snow like mounds of mashed potatoes flakes of snow like powdered sugar the chili birds fluffed up their feathers and chirped so i want you to just take a moment and think about this elaborative detail segment is focused around what critical element is that the critical character, the critical setting, or the critical object? So with students, of course, that's the question that we would ask because we do want to center around that character, setting, or object to see how the author illustrated this particular, and you're right, it is the setting, okay? So when we think about going to the next part, we've introduced with literature, now it's time for us as teachers to model that skill. Remember, Daya said this is about talking aloud as the author. It's really using those productive questions. You're answering them, the students are answering them, but what do I do when students seem a little bit behind? 
you still ask those questions. And so if you will remember when you're teaching narrative elaborative detail, those detail generating questions that revolve around these three elements of character setting an object, we have a menu of those. And of course you can add to those. So if you're thinking about this snow drift or this mound of snow, what was the temperature like? What was the weather like? Maybe what kinds of trees were around there? How did the air feel? Were there any animals? And if there were animals, what sounds did they make? Or how did you feel when you were there? So you can see these questions as we apply it to that particular passage, but these are the same questions students are going to generate responses for to create their segment on this particular setting. So if we go back and we look, we see heaps of snow like mashed potatoes. The author really could have said there was a lot of snow and they could have stopped, but we don't get the true understanding or comprehension without knowing from an author's perspective, ooh, what did it remind you of? A mound of mashed potatoes. Ooh, what did it look like? Powdered sugar. What animals did you see there? Birds. They flipped up their feathers, they chirped. So you can clearly see this setting here and what happened during that modeling. Now, one student, we have charted that with students, all those responses and remember teachers, what's really important during the modeling is that we take those responses and we keep adding them. We don't just respond once and then put our segment together. We take multiple responses because when it's time for the guided practice, this is where students are going to borrow those ideas from the chart. They're each going, they're not just copying what we wrote on that elaborative detail segment, but instead they get to make choices as the author of them crafting that piece. So what do they need? If they're behind, do they have all of the language? Do they have all the words? Not necessarily. So what do we continue to do? Same practice, providing those sentence starters, leaving those anchor charts up, we can see the snow. Maybe I need a boost though. I see snow. No, you can say there in front of me was, or I couldn't help but notice or looking closely. I want you to think about a student who feels less than confident about their writing. And if we were to provide one of these sentence starters, where could they get to in their confidence? It's a game changer. But again, it's our same practice. Now, remember too, in your hub, you have skill powers. Remember, those are going to be your instructional tools that enhance your lesson, okay, from the technology side. But within a skill power, this is where we lay out the instruction. This is where the kids see the language. This is what supports your teaching as well. We have images there, the sentence starters are included, the lesson plan falls right into the skill power. So it's identical, it matches and enhances it. But from a review and reinforcement perspective, when we're thinking about working with these students that maybe missed it the first time, or maybe even this year they're out or they're on quarantine, or they need to come back and have that um, one, just one more time, tell me one more time, that's where you can pull up this skill power with the teacher narrator. And so it can be um, independently listen to if they put go and put their headphones on they can listen to it one more time um, to get that instruction so that is another way to support those students anytime we're thinking about um, the application piece to this sometimes we say well we need to go back to it or I want to connect it with what we're doing in class and this is where your make it your own opportunities come in every skill that you deliver has a template for you to plug in your topic. Let's say you weren't writing about snow. You may not be this time of year. So what do you do? You talk about whatever critical setting is at the forefront of your instruction. Maybe it relates to the novel that you're reading. Maybe it relates to the season that we're in. Maybe the object relates to your science or social studies lesson, the character as well. All of these can find a place across students learning across the day. So the make it your own can be a great assistance piece to that um, to help with students. Now, when we think about the lesson that we just looked at, that was on elaborative detail for narrative. And yes, the student pieces that we're looking at are on narratives. 
But we also want to remind you that with any lesson, if we're going to help bring these kids up to speed with where they need to be, it's not going to happen overnight, but it can happen in incremental steps. And those incremental steps really are dependent on the way that we instruct our students, the consistency that we bring across. And so every time you plan a lesson, how do you begin? We need to think about that methodology. We need to think about starting with literature, modeling, using sentence starters, reinforcing, enhancing with skill powers, making sure that students have opportunity to apply the skill to the topic that we're doing, do that make it your own. We need to think about what language are we going to present? You have students that don't have the language you were expecting in your grade level like they have before, or maybe you've said, man, this group of students is really low. Well, what do we need to do to support that language? Provide the language for them. When we are about to teach, we have to have a handful of terms that we're ready to incorporate into that lesson. And we can only do that if we consider that student background knowledge. I want you to think about what do students have in relation to the topic that you're doing? This is critical in students understanding what they need to write about so they can match it with the strategy or the technique that they're using as authors. We can bring those experiences to them. So we don't shy away from topics that students don't already have background knowledge, but we bring it into the classroom and make sure that's a part of it. When all of this is in place, we also have to think about what are we going to chart? Where do the questions go? How do we respond to those? How are we going to pull all of that into a segment or whichever skill that we're working on? And how do those questions roll out? So there's a lot to think about teachers. I know there is um, as we um, really process through this with any skill that we have, we always return to these thoughts. Daya, do you have anything else um, along that line of thinking? No, I think that's, um, I think the real, the message in all of this is that um, for those of you who are familiar with how we work, all of the skills that exist, exist through each grade level. And so just like Jennifer said, it's all about not changing what we're doing. It's about slowing down the process um, and really revisiting all of this. So we, our students might've been at a place where we're able to let them go a little bit more independently, but you know what, that's not the case now. So it's not about um, changing what we do. And it's exactly to Jennifer's point. It's about thinking this process through, slowing it down and giving them more, more questions, more sentence starters, more modeling so that they can start to regain their confidence back to what, to where they really should be at this point. What happens with this, um, and this again, this, this was a checkpoint prompt. So remember we showed you Katie's piece when she went for her, um, to the grandmother's farm. Well, here is December of second grade with three months of instruction. So this is what the student was able to produce. Um, and I'm just gonna read this first page. I'm not gonna go through it all because I just want you to hear um, how this student has started to grow as a writer from the very um, didactic beginning that he went out and milked the cow and then he went, um, he, he found a puppy to this. I was outside on a wintry day it was icy cold and light white, and, the, and, and um, the sky was white like snow. I was having fun in the cold snow when I saw a gold and silver thing with bright purple, green, and turquoise blue diamonds. And it stood on an orange platform. It seemed to have wheels on the bottom of it, and it started to move, and I wondered why. Just page one from this student. Already we can start to see um, growth over time. I could tell you that we, at this point, the student had direct instruction in entertaining beginnings, elaborative detail, suspense. So as I look at the student work, I'm looking for evidence of the skills that I taught. But in the interest of time, what I wanna do is just cut ahead to the next piece. This was Ben's piece. And Ben was the student who had that piece that I, I couldn't even summarize what he was writing. Now, this is Ben's in January. And in January, he has been taught all of the skills at this point. So if you think of about the diamond, all of those skills have been presented in isolation, have been modeled. He's had time to practice it. And again, keep in mind, Katie and Ben 
took the same exact baseline at the beginning of the year. And where, where is Ben now? I slowly walked inside the oldest house in town. It smelled like coffins in this house. The black paint was chipped. I saw some scattered crumbs on the staircase. I saw some rotten cheese lying on the ground. I wonder if rats live in this house. I think I'll investigate. I came to a pile of bones and they all came together and a skeleton came out of the bones. He chased me and he chased me. I saw his hands coming at me. I heard clacking sounds. I finally slammed the door. Now I wish I never went into that house. Now clearly, Ben has a lot of room for additional growth, but look at how he has grown from the beginning of the year to January. And what I always like to emphasize when I look at his piece was it, it wasn't anything different. He sat in the class and got all of the lessons, skills in isolation, practicing those skills and really made some really remarkable growth through just common consistent approach to how we're going to look at writing. The other thing that I, I just want to add as a little aside here is this was actually a student of mine in Connecticut. And um, in Connecticut, we had to, we, we, our prompts were timed. That's not true everywhere, but it was true with us at, at the time. And he actually ran out of time. So he actually drew a line, his hands coming at me. And I had asked him to mark where he was and just to cont continue writing. So if he had had more time or felt like he didn't feel like time was an issue, he might have written more because typically when you tell kids keep writing, you know, that's for the 45 minute mic, but keep writing, they have a tendency to, um, to wrap it up a little bit more quickly. But what I love about this piece, and I don't know if I'm the, I know this is true for all of us. How many times do we ask kids to sit down and write and they are done in five minutes? And then they say, I'm done, right? How many times have you heard it? And it's like, the, it's, you hear that sound and, and it just... My, all of a sudden I forget how to teach well. And I say, you can't be done. You, you have to keep writing. And the reality is they are done. They don't know what else to write. This is a really wonderful illustration that when students have skills and they're taking skills to the task of writing, they're using all the time because they know what they need to be doing. And I think that's worth emphasizing here is that as we teach, as, um, the time was actually 45 minutes. So the line that's drawn is at 45 minutes. And I was still to point something else out because this also affected my teaching as well. What I really learned in this process was this, what's my objective? So while I was in a, in a state that was worried about kids writing in 45 minutes, I needed to say, objectively, my kids need to learn to write well first. Writing in 45 minutes is a, is a requirement for the assessment. And when it gets time to prepare for the assessment, I'll work on assessment um, test taking skills. But you know what? First and foremost, my job is to teach my kids to write well. And so that I'll do that. And then at a certain point in the year, as it gets closer to assessment, I'm going to worry about what are the requirements of the assessment. And I'm going to talk to my students about how they can make adjustments to fit into those re the requirement of the assessment. But really, objectively speaking, first job is to teach them how to write. And then from there, I could figure out how to teach them how to take that assessment. Any questions on that? Um, what we, um, Jen, do you want to add anything to that? So we do have a question here. Uh, do you have a list of mentor texts that you recommend for each skill, entertaining, beginning, elaborative detail, et cetera? So we do actually, we have um, in, as part of our, in our teacher's toolbox, I believe we have literature connections and really um, honestly, it's as simple as this. We pick up books and as we start to recognize those skills, we, we call it reading with author's eyes. And the minute you learn how to read with author's eyes and identify the skills that we're teaching all the time, and many of you know how to do it, you can't pick up a book without saying, oh, this is great for teaching elaborate detail. Oh, this is terrific for um, finding other ways to say said. And you'll, you, it'll just, they'll, they're everywhere around us. But certainly to begin with, we'll always give you some recommendations to sort of build your confidence, show you where they are. And some really, we have some all-time favorites that we love to share. 
And too, Michelle, um, within the lessons, we give excerpts. The snow one came from an excerpt right out of a lesson. And so we'll give you multiple ones of those, but authentically as a full book, um, just as Dayo was saying, you, you can't help but notice what those are um, when you run across each skill. So in talking as a school year has been getting going, um, what we're hearing from a lot of our school districts is sort of the frustration about where my kids are now. And, um, and some disappointments in terms of where they are and, and, um, and what they might need help with. And so as we as a team talk about ways in which we can best support you, um, one of the things that we really talked about was this particular activity called a sentence a day. And a sentence a day is actually a resource that we have. This one is actually not on the hub. It, it's only available in print. And I, I'm gonna hold this up. This happens to be for second grade. So some of you may have a sentence a day. But the idea of sentence a day is it's a resource that um, uses sentence structure and grammar and conventions. And each day it's a 10 minute lesson. And we're going to practice sentence structure with students and they're gonna add on. Um, we do not have it digital yet, but today what we're gonna do is we're gonna give you a, um, a code to scan so that you can download the first four weeks of this. So you're gonna have it and you can look at it really from a structure perspective. Um, we have a sentence a day really available for grades uh, K1 and two, is that right? K1 and two? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, um, oh, listen, Linda's saying she has it. She's, it's wonderful. She's been using it. Um, I do believe I, we sell it in, in um, is it available outside the US? That's a good question. Um, I'll get back to you on that one because I'm not sure where Kelly's coming from. So um, I'm not sure if that's specifically Australia. We don't have it in Australia yet, but um, we're talking about ways in which we can make this digital. Let me just turn this over to Jen, if you can talk a little bit about the sentence a day structure and lead us into um, how we might modify this, um, especially since someone asked, how can I do this in, in uh, intermediate grade levels? Yeah, so really it's the routine every day of making sure that you're drawing attention to structure of sentence. Um, those foundational skills, of course, we teach from kindergarten up, but that doesn't mean that the skills are present in each grade level um, if they haven't been rehearsed. So in 10 minutes a day, that's kind of the parameters that we put on it. What's going to happen is we're going to, as a teacher, you're going to read a story segment that ends in a, a question. It is a question that has a very predictable response. Um, in the beginning of the year, the responses are very short. Um, we grow them throughout the year through grammar, of course. The grammar is included with the second grade resource. And so after you read that short segment, no longer than a paragraph, then you chart the response as the teacher. Okay, so we always say, how do I know it's a sentence? And we want to hear the students talk about the parts of the sentence. Where's the subject? Where does the predicate? Notice the questions at the bottom underneath the lesson format. We're always going to ask them who the sentence is about and what, what they're doing. Okay, so who or what is doing what or is described as what. So how does it begin with the capital? That's what we want the students to say every day. How does it end? With a period. That's the response for them. So we'll put a slash between the subject and the predicate to identify those parts that we just talked about. And then we're going to have the kids write the sentence on their paper. So what are we expecting to see? That they have a subject, they have a predicate, it starts with a capital, it ends with a period. So to reinforce that, we are going to then ask them to underline the who part of the sentence in red. So they have their colored pencils, they have their um, highlighters, markers, whatever it is that you use as a utensil in your classroom to color code. So every day this color coding is the same. They're starting to see in color. That's a memory tool for our students. Very good. And then notice step five says they're going to underline the doing part of the sentence in green. So you wait, you allow them to underline in green, and then they'll trace the capital letter and the period in blue. So every time they're seeing these parts of a sentence. Okay, so they will write that response Monday you'll give another story segment on Tuesday. You write the sentence, they write the sentence, you go through the parts of it. Wednesday, same. Thursday, same. Okay, so each day that you're doing that, Monday through Thursday, you're going to go around and dot where the correct elements are. Okay, so you had a capital, you trace that in blue, excellent. I love how you put the slash through the subject and the predicate and you underlined the doing part. You also color coded your period or as the teacher, you're going to offer a correction as you see in that um, second piece there. 
what's happening is here every day students are getting that practice every day you're giving immediate feedback okay so immediate feedback is the key here because they need to be practicing but they need to be practicing it correctly we don't want to practice it wrong every day because that creates a habit so by the time we get to friday this is what we call friday free for all you're going to read and then the students will come up with their sentence okay so they write their sentence they diagram the simple sentence just as, as they have all week long okay so you can see every day of the week this is how it works out okay so when you think about this for other grade levels if you're thinking about well we'll sentence a day if i if i look at this sample and i like how it goes what do i do to come up with this for other grade levels well perhaps you're going to switch off the segments right obviously the students need the rehearsal of writing that sentence and you say they need that okay but have they already had that you switch out the segments, come up with a sentence. It's that generative aspect and then identifying what they wrote and what was inside of that sentence, okay? So you think about the grammar part of this, the subject, the predicate, the capitals, but does that spread even further? Absolutely. So what else could you do as a practice? And that's what we want you to think about. As you're returning to basics, What's going to be the routine to think about the parts of a sentence so that you're saying they can't even write a sentence, how can they get to elaborative detail go back to that go back to the heart of it okay. Now, I also want you to think about sometimes what that means is um, that we want to take a different spin on it, so we just want to show you another idea. Um, you're you're going to have so many ideas to come up with when you start thinking of this concept of going back to basics and having students um, be creative with their sentences and apply their learning throughout the year. Um, this is a, a, an example we created. This is actually my dog, Maggie Jo, um, and um, I take her out on a walk on a trail every day. Now, as I was doing that, she stops and she always smells this patch of flowers in the same spot on the trail. And I happen to think, you know, students do this, they capture the world around them and they need to be able to use language in order to describe that. And when they're doing that, what do they have to have? They have to have basic sentence structure. They have to have skills to elaborate on their sentences. That means they also have that powerful vocabulary. You're pushing that during your modeling lessons. When you do that, are they making application of those same vocabulary words that you're using then to other times? And so you'll notice, maybe I shot this picture, maybe students bring in a picture. They take their phones, they take a picture, or they get a picture from home. You let them take a picture with an iPad, make a connection to self, and then they start with a very simple sentence. So I just chose a sentence that is said, right, before, stop and smell the roses. So let's revise. That's not really a rose. How about we say stop and smell the sunflowers. So if a student were doing this, they would be showing these revisions as they're taking place, but they're thinking of the skills they know to make it better. But let's not say smell. Let's say inhale. Stop and inhale the fragrant scent of sunflowers. Hmm. Now, where were we? Maybe I could add a preposition. Stop and inhale the fragrant scent of sunflowers along the side of the Heritage Park Trailway. But I remember that we've been elaborating. So maybe I could elaborate on that a little bit since you don't know who this is. And I could say, stop and inhale the fragrant scent of sunflowers along the side of the Heritage Park Trailway. Maggie, a Bernice Mountain Dog frequent visitor, agrees that they are as warm and inviting as the sweet summer sun. Now, as a student, I've gone from my first sentence to two fully elaborated and quite impressive vocabulary. I'm proud of my work. And again, remember, that's what we're working on with our students. And all the time, as we look at how we could point out the skills here or students could do this and illustrate which skills that they've used. Did I use a vivid verb? Yes. I'm going to show you. Did I use word reference? Yes, look at them in blue. Did I use a preposition? Yes. Teachers, are you teaching these skills? Aren't these the same skills we're wanting students to have? And so again, why are we showing you this? We want to remember that we can have fun going back to the basics and incorporating and applying the skills, applying the skills that students need to have, okay? So you do have that sentence a day sample. Um, 
we are going to um, allow you to take that QR code here on the right hand side if you're interested in taking that sample and perhaps you want to kind of make it your own depending on your grade level if it is um, a little lower than what you would like it to be. Also remember the Maggie example to come up with some of your own ideas for practicing those skills. On the left hand side of the screen, you also have a certificate request. So if you need to, um, we still have a few minutes, of course, but I, while you're looking at this, I want you to know what it is. The certificate request will give you um, the credit that you'll need paperwork wise um, for attending today's webinar. So let's look and see um, any questions about what we've gone over today. Feel free to unmute. If you want to, I see some of you have said you have sentence a day. It's wonderful. This is your first year to use it. Good. And I just want to say, you know, we, we at Empowering Writers are, are very hopeful for a year like this when we have come back and really seen some more face-to-face -face interaction. Yes, there may be some of you um, that are not, um, but what do we do when we're not? What do we do when we're virtual? This kind of thinking leads us to that same exact place, going back to what we know is best. So we're going to be offering these webinars um, on a somewhat weekly basis. We're going to try to um, uh, put um, topics out there that are most are the most um, uh, the hot topics for all of you and the things that um, that come up. So if any of you um, have any particular questions or or things that you want us to talk about, we certainly are always um, are always looking to really meet your immediate needs. Um, for those of you that are using Empowering Writers, of course, all of you have access to us. Um, you know how to, to reach us, just go to our website and, um, and reach out and ask us any questions that you have. Um, and uh, we're happy to answer those questions. So in terms of, is there a formal launch for Empowering, for empowering Writers? So we do provide training sessions. Um, lots of times we put these webinars together and the webinars don't necessarily launch us formally um, in this webinar, this webinar um, uh, format, but we try to put together information that it, whether you're using Empowering Writers um, or you're familiar with our content that you can have some takeaways even if you're not using it. So our goal really is, is to um, impact your classrooms as best we can. So if there's topics that you that that you want to hear more about, if there's struggles that you're having that are unique to us coming back to school, um, we certainly um, want to help you with that process. A question. Go ahead, Rick. Might might there be in the coming months some uh, webinars that apply to more of the intermediate grades? Yes. Even though what you shared, you can apply it as well. I just love it when it's already created where I'm not having to rewrite a book and I right. can produce or use what you have. That's part of my uh, struggle, but thank you. Yes, we're going to, we, we really try to make sure that our, you know, lots of times we have a tendency to really gear towards, you know, fourth and fifth grade. So you can bring it down or bump it up. Um, this one was a little bit more basic because we felt really strongly that so many of our teachers are saying, I don't need to be bumping anything up right now. I need to be going back to basics. And so that's really what we want to focus on. I agree. Everything she said fits right in my class in our writing the past two weeks. Can't even write a sentence. Good. Well, then, then you would benefit from this kind of work. And um, Kelly, I'm glad that you're with us at 6.45 a.m. in Australia. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in, having your coffee with us. And are these webinars, by the way, are always going to be at this time. Um, because it, it, we find that it, it's good for our, um, our Canadian audience as well. And we're, I'm on the East Coast. Uh, Jen is in Texas. So it works for all of us. Uh, one, of the, one of the webinars that we're just talking about, and you can just say if there's an interest in that, one of the ones that we're really talking about now is uh, we, have a, we have a few planned for um, responding to text and um, 
literary analysis tasks already, but we were, we were really talking about um, for so many of us who use reading programs that have embedded writing programs in them, a lot of uh, feedback has been that the writing programs are, are missing the mark in terms of the writing, embedded writing is really just assignments and not enough instruction. So um, oftentimes the question is, how do we uh, use empowering writers in conjunction with our reading um, that we're doing? So if that's a topic that's of interest with you, just give us a, um, a yay or a nay, and, um, and we will uh, be working on those topics as we, as we develop our schedule. And, and if you register for the webinar, you'll, you'll get emails um, of the upcoming ones. Thanks, Michelle. Michelle gave us a yay. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Yes, please. Okay. Yeah, you know, the, that whole idea um, that we oftentimes have these, these reading programs, but we feel inferior, inferior in the writing department. And a lot of times we take that on as our teaching ability saying, I, I assign these lessons for my kids to do, and I feel as though I'm not being successful. And it's really because there's not enough instruction that takes place. There's not direct instruction of writing. And in order for our kids to become good writers, we really need to provide that direct instruction. So um, one of the things that we love to do is simplify that process for you so that you can um, feel confident as a teacher of writing. So super, if anybody had trouble downloading any information um, that you needed, just uh, feel free to reach out to us. We really thank you for spending um, the last 45 minutes with us and we're, we're happy to hang out. If anybody wants to um, unmute and chat a little bit with us, feel free. And the rest of you, we're, we again appreciate you and we're, we're hoping that this is gonna be a fabulous year and we're gonna be here to support you in the process. I know a couple of you are waiting on links for QR codes. Those are coming. Um, if you are unable to access via QR, we are going to put the link, the direct link to that in the chat momentarily. Thanks, Alicia. Thank you, Julia. And for those of you who had your cameras on, you, next time I'm going to have a bonus prize for those that have cameras on. I don't know what it's going to be yet. I got to think about it, but I can't tell you how much Jennifer and I love looking at faces. <laughs> so I have a question there. Sure. So we used to use empowering writers and much to my disappointment, we went to readers work, uh, writers workshop, readers and writers workshop, because we were doing readers workshop along with empowering writers. So now they wanted us to do readers and writers workshop. And they said, oh, well, if you want, you can incorporate the empowering writers into your workshop model. Is that workable? So the answer is, you know, um, that whole idea of the workshop model is, is an interesting, is an interesting um, concept in terms of are we in fact, do we in fact work that way? When you think about how we instruct and how our methodology works, we're very much structured like that, right? We have, we do whole class instruction, we introduce and define the skill, we model the skill, um, and then we go to the writing. The biggest difference is this, in the, um, in the writer's workshop model, oftentimes the assignments are not really there. It's the kids are going to write about what they want to write about. Right. Um, and to me, that is a recipe for disaster. It's Agreed. like, if you're teaching me to play the piano, you need to teach me foundational skills first before you say, day is sit down and play whatever you want. Because playing whatever you want is not going to yield any result at the end. It's not to say that our students won't be able to write what they want to, they will be able to. However, you can't do anything without skill. So, so our work, and always when we look at that, that model is what we would say to you is, Whatever it is that they need to be writing about, they need to have that skill work to go first. So just like Jennifer took us through the whole process of what does it look like to teach elaborative detail, we teach it first. Then they can go and pick what they want to write a, a descriptive segment about, but not without those skills. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I have a question. So... Um, my, I have a friend who has been to the Empowering Writers Workshop since she was the one who recommended it to me. Um, I just started teaching fourth grade uh, reading and writing. And so she shared with me like a, 
an editing, revising, and more student book for grade four. And so I've been using that, but she told me that there's like more to it. So I was just wondering like, how could I have like my campus purchase that or where would I find it or? When you say more to it, do you mean, are you referring to the workbooks? Yes, so this is what I have. So she sounds have, like she has the workbook, but not the teacher book. Yes. Oh, okay. So, so I just, you're missing the teacher manual. So that's where all the lessons come from. And of course, okay. what makes it unique as a resource is that it includes the link to the genre lessons as well. There are extensions that really provide application um, in a couple of ways. So you have application to some hands-on learning. Um, you also have application to generating using the skill like we did with the Maggie example. So trying to get the kids to practice what they're learning, not just from a grammar standpoint, but from a genre standpoint, okay. from a skill standpoint. And so you really do need that teacher resource yeah. to accompany that because you do just have the student pages and that's only the beginning of the instruction. Um, you can get that on our website. So if you go to www.empoweringwriters.com, uh -huh. and then you'll notice on, across the top bar, one of the last options says store. And then you'll hold on the top bar. Oh, I see. Uh-huh. Yeah. It'll say store. Uh, and then once you get into the store, you'll look for the editing and revising materials and search for your grade level. And there will be a description there for you. And you can okay. order directly through there or you can order with a PO. We also have, um, we have some recorded um, available um, for purchase, some recorded sessions on editing and revising. Um, okay. That would be training great. as well. I have okay. another question. Yeah, go right ahead. Sorry. That's Sorry okay. to be so many questions. Um, so I have the narrative guide, the expository guide, and I have the essential guide. So I work in an underserved community, a lot of second language learners, um, a lot of delay even before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So my essential guide is heads and shoulders above. So I teach fourth grade, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. So my fourth grade essential guide is like heads and shoulders above where they are. I can't even use it. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, am I teaching narrative and expository in tandem? Or like my initial thought was, okay, I'll do narrative till you know, holiday time, and then I'll do expository come January to May. I just wanted your thoughts on that. So what's interesting is you actually have two schools of thought in that collection of books. Um, the essential guide was right. created with narrative and, and informational being taught side by side, and the other two guys are genre specific. So we actually no longer have the essential guide. Um, we don't we don't print that one anymore okay. um, because I think a lot of teachers found it. Um, there was a great, there's a, we have a community of teachers that absolutely love teaching it side by side. And then so many districts will give them scope and sequence where you're focusing on narrative, right. then you're focusing on informational. So we needed to keep that part separate. So there's no wrong or there's no right or wrong way to do it. It's really what's clear in your mind. Here's what we found is teachers that were very adept with empowering writers, very comfortably picked up the essential guide and taught them side by side. Um, with that continually spiraling back to one or the other. Um, teachers who were not as familiar with empowering writers had a much more difficult time managing that approach. So uh, most of the districts that we work in now say that we're going to do X number of weeks of narrative and X number of weeks of, um, of informational. The biggest change I can say, the biggest difference that we've done is this year we put together what we call the literacy launch. And essentially what we've done is this is we've taken the whole idea of narrative writing and informational writing where we used to teach them, um, we used to introduce them uh, individually and we introduce them together. So in the literacy launch, we, we launch narrative writing, informational writing and opinion writing on what we call an awareness level. Is that so a that book, student, Is that absolutely. a book? Like the literacy, so, level, is that its own book? No, it's actually just a revised um, section that we did. And I think um, uh, that it's just a revised section of how we look at it. So you're familiar with all of them. So basically what we've done is instead of waiting to teach informational writing, our thought was this, wait a minute, if we're really gonna use every in every interaction with literature as an opportunity to read with author's eyes, we've got to introduce it right up front. So we introduce narrative 
writing, we introduce informational writing, we introduce the pillar and the diamond, and we annotate narrative and expository or informational writing right up front, beginning of the year. So that's done. So we spend a, probably four or five weeks on that whole literacy launch. And then from there, you can move seamlessly into narrative or informational because you've done the foundational work that's necessary. And what's, what is um, powerful about that is that across content areas, every time your kids are in front of text, there is no reason for that you not to have that conversation is what type of writing is this? Why did the author write this? Was it, is it informational and narrative and basis? What organizational framework supports this writing? And so they start to look at writing from the level of at least the awareness level. Um, we're not asking them to generate it until we teach those skills, but initially we can have more in-depth conversations about text, a greater understanding of text if they get that all that um, information up front. Thank you. So we'll probably, uh, let me just, Jen, be my memory for me. Did we do a webinar of the literacy launch? I believe we did. So th that would mean, Michelle, in our webinar library uh, from webinars that we did last year, the literacy launch was presented. So you can pop onto that. And, um, and it's, again, it's going to be 45 minutes. Just take a look at what the literacy launch is all about. I think that would be really helpful. And especially um, to, the, to your question about what should I be teaching? Great, thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else have questions while you have us? Jen, what are you showing off here? So um, several people are asking for the link to training and I've put that in the chat box, but I also just wanted to show you that when you go to teachers, it's right underneath workshops. So the link- And there's is Jen's there. picture. That's your picture. <laughs> Yes. Um, all of the workshops that we have with a description are going to be in this location so that you can see the different ones that are available. So depending on what works best for you, we do have live Zoom. So that's virtual learning that you can choose that, that are already set up for different grade levels. Um, there are some that are set up if you're in Texas in person. And then we also have those pre-recorded or what we call on-demand PD, where you can learn on your own time with whichever one you're referring to. And so there's narrative, informational, the K-1 getting ready to write, and then the editing and revising currently for grades three and four. Notice those descriptors are down below if you have any question about what would be a part of that. And then likewise, somebody asked about finding the resources. And so when you click on the store at the top, then you can go to whichever um, one piques your interest for that. Yeah, I will say that um, as challenging as this, these last 15 months have been, it, it's what has been good is some of the ways in which we can deliver content. So uh, we work really, really hard at creating um, Zooms that, that are interactive and allow you really to take the most out of it. And um, those recorded sessions have been really helpful for teachers because right now I, we all want to be learning on our own time because everything is just seems that there's a lot on our plate. So those sessions really allow you to learn that way. I also provided my email address if you want to scroll back up. If you have any questions or um, some of you are, are getting resources from other teachers and you want to talk a little bit more about what that could look like in your school, please reach out to me. We can talk on an individual. We can, of course, stay on now, um, but any other time or you come across any other questions that you would like to have answered. Sorry, I'm reading and talking at the same time. Um, and, you know, that's one of the things that we, we really love to do is to really work with districts, problem solve, talk about what's working, what's not working. And certainly I think one of the things that we're most proud of is that all of us at Empowering Writers are, are educators. We've all been in the classroom. Um, we know what the realities are of that writing is one aspect of your day. Um, so we're not looking to make it more difficult. We're finding ways um, for you to be able to feel really successful with it. The majority of our teachers uh, don't view themselves as writers and don't always feel comfortable teaching it. And so really what our role is, is to um, build that confidence, build that comfort and really empower you to be a teacher of writing. 
So again, we thank all of you for joining us. You've been a terrific group and uh, great questions, and we love the opportunity to chat with you. And um, we're going to be back here, I think, next week. We have another webinar scheduled. Um, that information will be coming out on Friday. So um, fr oh, no, it comes out on Sunday. It comes out on Sunday, I think. Um, uh, anyway, thanks for being here, everybody.